Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball Today, and welcome to Jordan Walker season. Monday, March 6th, Frank Stample joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, we're doing Sleepers 2.0. We've got a big week here. We'll hit Sleepers, Breakouts, Bust each of the next three days. And we got Scott's Tout Warriors draft coming up a little bit later on in the week. So we'll recap all that fun stuff. Had an awesome time this weekend at First Pitch Florida. Big thank you to Brent Hershey and Ray Murphy from Baseball HQ putting on a together uh, a tremendous event uh, down at First Pitch Florida. Thank you to Steve Gardner for the invite to National League Labor. We'll recap that draft on Wednesday as well. So we'll get like some of Scott's Tower Wars, some of my National League Labor. So you'll we'll kind of hit all different kind of parties, mixed leagues, mono leagues, all that kind of fun stuff. Chris, how's the weekend, bud? How you doing? Good. I just watched The Last of Us. Uh, and that was a super, super intense episode. No spoilers. And ne- next week is the, the finale. And boy, the internet's going to be a blaze when the finale drops because i don't know if you guys have ever played that game the yes. ending is wild chris and i played it i played it last year upon your recommendation you don't remember this i i i have a famously poor memory scott but yeah. i appreciate that and the ending people are going to have some feelings about the end of this television se- season and uh it's gonna be really interesting to witness Chris, is this just one season of the show? Is is that just the end of it, or how? No, it? they're doing a second season. Okay. They've already confirmed that. Cool. Yeah, I had no idea, so I was I was very interested to know. Uh, anywho, let's get into uh, Jordan Walker and talk about the hype. And I I'm sure Scott's to... weekend was fine. Yeah, yeah. Scott, how's the weekend? Any partying? <laughs> <laughs> Scott, fine. I went that. I went bowling with some kids. I actually, we did since you we talked about since we talked about my bowling frustrations the last. Uh, the last time I went bowling, I actually bowled the best game I had in quite some time. Broke it'd been a long time since I broke 100. I know that's not aiming very high, but I got a I got a 124. That's right. good. Curve. The curve was curving properly. I realized I was standing not in the right spot and I needed to stand further left so that it had room to curve more. This is this is like when Francisco Liriano had to move all the way to the far end of the mound to, exactly. to get his slider right. I mean, it's 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 exact. It's just like that. Gosh, the, just as important. The real quote unquote real bowling players out there, bowlers, bowling players, bowlers, bolsters, uh, bolsters are definitely just laughing at us right now because <laughs> Scott, I'm in the same range as you. Like if I bowl over a hundred, I feel great about it, and mm-hmm. you know that's in the grand scheme of things, I guess that's not really that great. Anywho, let's talk about somebody who is great or potentially great Jordan Walker. And I don't want to make this entire podcast. Like every single day we're talking about Jordan Walker. We're coming on here because just the other day we had the Welsh on here and he was talking about how much he loves Jordan Walker this season. Um, And also if you're one of those people that it's like spring training doesn't matter. This doesn't mean anything. A you're no fun and B it does matter. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Uh, I was at the game Saturday. I was there live again, down in Florida this weekend Jordan Walker went four for four. He hit two home runs, one off Josiah Gray, one off of Cade Cavalli. Yes, not the stiffest competition, obviously, but both of these home runs were lasers. I There's no exit velocity readings in the ballpark, but these were missiles. They were out in a hurry. He also added a single, uh, an infield single, so flashing a little bit of speed, and a double in the game as well. Everybody in the park was buzzing uh, about Jordan Walker while we were there. And I say that a game like this does matter in spring training spring training because something like this gets Jordan Walker to that much closer to an opening day job. It doesn't necessarily mean that he will get it, but it does increase the probability. So Scott, I'll start with you. How do you react to something like this? I get that it's a small sample size, but we're now getting some pretty big games from Jordan Walker in spring training. Uh, Are you moving him up your rankings? If so, how far, what do you think about everything going on here? I mean, I feel like I already had him ranked a lot higher than the consensus. My, but it's it's been a goal in every draft of mine, regardless of what my needs were, to get Jordan Walker, um, and I managed to do it in TGFBI in round fourteen of that fifteen team league. I also so, got him in round fourteen. Let's go! So what, I'm trying to figure out exactly what pick that was. Uh, it was pick 202, 203. Yeah, 
I got him at 200 and you're picking eight. So 203. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I'm, I'm wondering now, cause this, this pick came in before the four for four, two Homer game over the weekend. And I'm wondering, okay, I got my tout wars draft coming up. Also a 15 team Roto league. Where am I going to have to, to continue with this goal of mine to get Jordan Walker in every draft, which by the way, I haven't succeeded in that. I've just aimed to, to do it. Where am I going to have to try for him in tout wars? Uh, and I believe you have some data on that, Frank. Yes, I do. So over the weekend, there were 16 NFBC drafts that were done. The ADP for Jordan Walker was 143.9, <laughs> just ahead of Ian Happ, Jorge Polanco, and Rowdy Telez. There was also yeah. a mixed Roto uh, labor salary cap draft this weekend. Jordan Walker went for $12. It was the same price as Nick Castellanos. Now that doesn't take into account his game Sunday where he went 0 for 4 with a strikeout, pretty embarrassing strikeout against uh, the, the, the finally unveiled ghost fork of Kodai <laughs> Senga. Um, so maybe, maybe everyone backs off now. Probably not. Probably not. I'm probably going to have to think round 12 now in a 15 team league for Jordan Walker. Um, but I, I think it's worth it. And, you know, before when we talked about them, uh, you know, even, even though I just said I was drafting a bunch of them, it's it's because I, I think he'll be up sooner than later, but I wasn't all that confident he'd make the opening day roster, not like I was for Julio Rodriguez last year or Pete Alonzo four years ago. I, I was pretty sure they'd be on the opening day roster, and they were. There's, you know, there's, there's still a fair amount of doubt with Walker because it's, hard for me to picture the Cardinals backing off from Tyler Tyler O'Neill, Lars Newbar, and Dylan Carlson. I kind of feel like they've seen all they need to see from Carlson at this point, but um, I don't think they feel that way. But there is still that DH spot that has a lot of flexibility, and it, it's not like everybody has to have a committed everyday role. Uh, and it, it, you know, the, the way um, the way the manager's talking, it, it's it sounds like Jordan Walker may be forcing the issue. So I'm giving it, I'm giving it probably like a 60, 40 chance. He is on the opening day roster. Now, of course, like the incentives have changed for front offices on this. Cause it was before like, okay, let's, let's wait a few weeks so that we can secure an extra year of control. But now it's if, 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 if a player is on, the roster from opening day to the end of the year. The key is they have to be on their opening day. If they finish high enough in rookie of the year voting, or even high enough in MVP voting for the first couple years of their career, then the team gets awarded draft picks. So it's and like, do, do they value the control more? Do they value the draft picks more? I kind of get the sense they value the draft picks more. And there's that, that also oh, Walker's chances. There's also the player side where i think if they hold them back and they finish is it top three in rookie of the year if they win rookie of the year they get the full year of eligibility anyway so there's some risk in holding them back anyway yeah mm, i hadn't heard that part yeah that's, that's the that's the other part of the rule am i making i'm not making that up am i say it again chris that if a player doesn't have a full year of eligibility but they get i think it's top two in rookie of the year voting as someone said in the comments they get that uh, year, the full year of service time. There, there is something like that. That that sounds right, um, but probably which is just to say that there's both carrot and stick when it comes to service manipulation. Chris, what's your read on this latest situation? Because right now we're kind of we're at an interesting point in draft season where we still don't know on Jordan Walker. Like, mm -hmm. yes, we're hopeful that he can that he's kind of like playing himself into an opening day job. But if we're talking about someone who's going inside the top 150 now, who, okay, even if he gets sent down, like he's probably up within a month anyway, we hope. But what, what's your kind of read on, on how fast this is moving in terms of uh, the rise in ADP for Jordan Walker? So it it's as we're talking, right? Like March 5th at 10.57 p.m., I would say it's more likely and probably much more likely than not that he makes the opening day roster at this point. However, Cardinals have a bunch of guys going to the World Baseball Classic. He's going to play a ton. It's possible that his next 20 plate appearances end with two hits and, and nine strikeouts, and it kind of becomes a moot point. But 
this is starting to feel like Fernando Tatis a couple of years ago where it just, it didn't seem all that likely at the start of spring. And then it just became inevitable. And in terms of whether he's worth drafting, we're talking about arguably the, the top prospect in baseball, certainly a top five guy by pretty much every accounting put up really good numbers in the minors has the, both the the production profile and the scouting profile of a superstar caliber player. There's some risk that he's not going to live up to all that, but he looks completely legitimate. He he's so talented. It's the kind of player that you want to see make the made the opening day roster. And it's the type of player that, you know, like you guys mentioned, you want on your team. Now you can't do that in every draft. And you and the three of us have the flexibility of, playing 13 leagues and drafting 27 times. And so we're going to have chances to get Jordan Walker on our team. If it becomes the to the point where he's a top 100 pick, which it very well could, then it's harder to justify. It's harder for me to say, you need to take Jordan Walker with a top 100 pick. If that's what it ends up costing by the end of spring and you only play in one league, this is definitely one of those like, if you play in multiple leagues, make sure you get some Jordan Walker. But like, well, even, I'm going to have a hard time saying like, yeah, you should pass up Xander Bogarts to take Jordan Walker. You know, like that, that's tough. To yeah. Do. Well, yeah, if it gets that high, but you, Jordan, what, what's Xander Bogarts ADP? It's pretty well inside the top 100, right? Uh, 86.6. Uh, it's it's overall. more like Reese Hoskins versus Jordan Walker. Sure. Um, Vinny Pass. And this is where is I think five. The fantasy analysis. I mean, we're pretty good on this podcast. We keep the focus geared toward 12 team leagues, but so much of the fantasy fantasy, so many fantasy analysts are talking in terms of 15 team leagues, like the vast, 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 vast majority of the audience plays in 12 teams or fewer. And I think the shallower your league is. So this covers most of the audience, the more justifiable it is to take a chance on upside. Once you get beyond the true studs, which certainly, Mm -hmm. um, by the by the time you get to 100th in the rankings you're beyond the sure studs and so i think if if we're talking like to 10 team leaguers out there i would say draft jordan walker uh however early you think you need to draft him to get him you know maybe not maybe not like the first six rounds but at some point after that at at least in you know at, at least as things stand now like you said chris over the next couple weeks things may change he may struggle and it it becomes clearer that he's not going to make the roster and then certainly his ADP would fall still probably worth drafting at that point. Just yes. stash for May 1st or whatever. But um, yeah, I would say, I would say enthusiasm is rightfully very high. It should be about as high as it was for Julio Rodriguez at this time mm-hmm. a year ago. And if we do get confirmation at any point that Jordan Walker will make the opening day roster, he will be a top 100 pick. That, and that is a prediction. That's the thing where it's like, now that's why right now is the time to draft Jordan Walker. Cause if he, if we get confirmation, like right now it looks it like go either way, though, you know, certainly... it could go either well, way. It's... Chris. I kind of feel like we're at a crossroad because you're right. If he does struggle for like the next two weeks and he starts the year in the minors and he's not up for a month, then he probably should not be going. Well, into I, I, 200. But you know, I don't know. I mean, 150. So it's 150 right now. We were, we were making the hypothetical of if he was going in the top 100, it's, it's more like 150 right now. Yeah, I think that's pretty low risk still. Yeah, uh, I, I I think you know even if even if he they announce oh he's not going to make the opening day roster you're you're going to hold on to him until he comes up. Yeah, like, he's going to come up sooner than later. Would I rather draft Matt Chapman or Jordan Walker and just maybe have to figure out third base for a month? I'd rather just have Jordan, Jordan Walker. Yeah, certainly twelve teams are shallower. Yeah. All right. So Jordan Walker is on the rise. Worth mentioning that Dylan Carlson is dealing with an arm injury right now, so he will not throw again until Monday. So if anything comes of that, obviously that makes it a little bit more clear for uh, Jordan Walker to get a job on opening day as well. Let's get into Sleepers 2.0. We did uh, Sleepers Breakouts and Bus as one podcast back on January 31st. The names that we gave out as Sleepers then, Charlie Morton, Brian De La Cruz, Miguel Vargas for Scott, Edward Cabrera, Brandon Lau and Jesse Winker for Chris. And then for me, Rowdy Telez, who also has moved up. I've noticed over the past month or so, Reed Detmers and CJ Abrams. 
Uh, I could tell you that there was a lot of excitement for Reed Detmers this past weekend, just in terms of panels and AL only. And, and people are pretty excited about Reed Detmers and, and rightfully so. Let's get into a sleepers 2.0 and uh, Scott, we'll start with you. I don't know if you have the rundown open, but we're going to do this in terms of two player pairings. And uh, I've got your okay. outfielders first. Do you remember which ones you gave me? No. <laughs> okay, so you've got Trey Mancini and Jared Kelnick. Ah, yes. Trey Mancini and Jared Kelnick. Oh, boy. This will be fun. Okay, so let's start with Trey Mancini, I guess. And uh, it's kind of funny I'm bringing him up as a sleeper because a couple weeks ago on the Mailbag podcast, somebody presented him as a sleeper. And I kind of poo-pooed it like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, I think I've seen enough from Trey Mancini and he is who he is. Well, I actually had the opportunity to draft him over the weekend in TGFBI um, right around the 300th pick, 280th pick, something like that. Something basically in line with his ADP. And um, so I took a closer look at him, closer than I have since I made out my rankings in October. And I liked a lot of what I saw. For instance, he was 80th percentile last year and max exit velocity. And that was lower than usual for him. Usually he's between 90th and 100th percentile for maximum exit velocity. Maximum exit velocity is the best indicator of raw power. So it's not like he's one of these post-juice ball guys who shouldn't be able to hit the ball out of the park anymore. Even his average exit velocity was pretty good, 61st percentile. And in previous years, it's been higher than that, closer to 70th percentile. For somebody who hits the ball that hard, Trey Mancini doesn't strike out much, consistently below 25% with that strikeout rate. Um, and though his numbers were pretty underwhelming last year, justifiably, you know, it's justifiable why he's going as late as he does based on the numbers. Prior to the trade to Houston, he was batting 268. The overall stat line still wasn't that impressive because he was playing his home games in Baltimore with that ridiculous left field <laughs> that was suffocating everybody's power. Uh, and he looked going into the season like he'd be especially vulnerable to it, even more than Ryan Mountcastle. So so he's, he's hitting 268 in spite of that. He goes to the Astros where he's not playing all that regularly, and so his batting average plummets. Um, and then I was reading about how there was a flaw in his swing during that time basically it was leaking and if you don't know what leaking means on the swing it's when you shift your your body is out of sync with your hands basically you're shifting your body weight forward before your hands start moving so it, it takes away a lot of your power and he astros coaches discovered that and pointed it out to him late in the year basically like in the postseason so he didn't really have much time to work on it uh but he worked on it in the off season he feels like he's in a good place with it now and I think there is a chance he could return to being like a, you know, 275, 280, 30 homer type in a more favorable hitting environment than where he spent most of last season with more regular playing time, obviously further removed from the year he missed with cancer and um, has had a chance to rebuild his strength, strength, fix his swing, should get tons of opportunities with the Cubs. Uh, even when Matt Mervis comes up, you know, presumably that means Eric Hosmer is the one shifting out of the way for him and, and not Trey Mancini. So I think he could be a nice find late. Had, a, had 115 mile an hour batted ball today, hit a 400 foot home run. That was harder than any batted ball he hit all last season. And That's the previous the, season. Uh, hardest he's hit in, in, in StackCast history. Looks like 115.8. Uh, yeah, 115 point. Was it 115.8? What'd you say? 115.1. Okay. So, yeah. So right had, there. Th those decimal In, in 2017, places. he hit at least one harder than that. But that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, a, look, it's not it's not proof of anything. But, look, I took him it's, at 259 in TGFBI. So, I, I'm happy. Like, that's my starting first baseman. I'm not thrilled with that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do think there's a chance this. in a fifth. Well, I, I've got, I've got a lot of outfielders, you know, <laughs> I got Jesse Winker on the bench already. Hey, so that's not bad. It's that's another sleeper that we've got on the list. Um, yeah. So Winker. yeah, but like, it's not the worst thing in the world. If in a 15 team league, I have a Trey Mancini bounce back in my first base spot. It could work out. It could work out. Yeah. That's, that's exact. That's the argument I'm making. Right. 
All right, so that's Trey Mancini. The other one here is Jared Kelnick. Oh, Scott, that's... you didn't hear? You're you're not allowed to like Jared Kelnick. <laughs> well, that's what I'm that's what I'm getting to here. Spring training so, stats don't count, Scott. <laughs> Jared Kelnick hit his fourth home run of the spring on Sunday. Uh, another just monster shot. I didn't get a, a I didn't see a distance for it, but went over the very tall batter's eye. That's in a lot of those parks in, in Arizona, in center field, center field, uh, just clobbered. All of them have been clobbered. The exit velocity readings on these have been comparable to only like the hardest hitters in all of baseball, Aaron Judge and and uh, Jordan Alvarez. Like he had uh, the game where he hit two home runs earlier this spring. He had three batted balls of a certain exit velocity or higher. That was only five players in all of baseball accomplished last year. So like he he has the upside clearly um but t- i tweeted out during that two homer game i was just referencing or actually it was the third home run he hit so it was off a lefty he hit it to the opposite field and i just tweeted out look at that oppo power off a lefty and these were some of the responses i got to that tweet um don't fall for it, Scott. He's a quadruple A who can't handle MLB when the games really count. Ah, if only spring trained, ca- training counted. Admiral Akbar from Star Wars saying it's a <laughs> trap. Don't do this, Scott. He's going to join the infamous Greg Bird Spring Training Hall of Fame. That pitch uh, found the middle. Doesn't he always do this in spring? So we all going to do this again. It looked like a BP pitch, though. I hate this. Because I, like, sort of related. I tweeted, like, just completely just offhand, hey, Nolan Jones could play every day in Colorado. That might be kind of interesting. And someone was like, Nolan Jones is going to have to be good before it becomes (laughs) in. It's like, yeah, of course. Like, but we're the point you're about to make is, like, it costs nothing. Yes. Well, Yes. So uh, my my point of bringing that up isn't just to like vent to you guys. It, it's to say <laughs> like, here is evidence. Jared Kelnick is a sleeper. Like nobody wants anything to do with him anymore. They've made it abundantly clear every time I tweet about him. And that's how you like, that is the truest form of sleeper. A lot of times we talk about sleepers and it's a bunch of guys. Everybody kind of likes, but they, everybody's, you know, trying to wait everybody out to get him at a range that still makes him a sleeper and sometimes the value gets forced up and they become not such a sleeper anymore as may be happening with Jordan Walker. But, and Jared, Jared, Jared Kelnick has burned so many people through his first two seasons in which he hit like 165 over a season's worth of at bat. So it's understandable. Like he's genuinely terrible, but he's being drafted around 300 on average. Now, like a 12 team head to head league, isn't going to get to pick 300. So he's basically free. He's 23 years old still. That's that's the part I can't get over. Like most prospects don't reach the majors for the first time until they're 23. So like if Jared Kelnick had just continued to do what he did in the minors and this was the year they were opening up the spot for him, our attitude toward him would be way different, you know? Just based on based on the numbers he put up at AAA last year. None of the four home runs has been off uh has been off a breaking ball, I think is worth pointing out. In the end, the pessimism may be warranted. He still can't hit anything other than a fastball. But gosh, he's still revealing the upside that got us so excited in the first place. And he hasn't just been sitting in his hand on his hands all offseason. Like he's tried to work to correct the things. I know he's made changes to his stance. Um, among other things. And it's just like, why not? Like, wh- what? who's a better fifth outfielder pick at that very late stage of the draft? Or it doesn't even have to be your fifth outfielder, bench player, you know? Like, there's no harm in just p- picking Jared Kelnick, and, and maybe this is the year at 23 that uh, it all comes together. Now, there is something that the Twitter trolls are right about, Scott, and that's that Jared Kelnick usually does do this in spring training. So we saw it last year. He hit... Uh, Three home runs with an 883 OPS, super small sample size, only 13 games. 2021, he hit 300. He's already got more than that now. He hit 300 with two home (laughs) runs. Uh, Again, these are like super small sample sizes, so I get it. But he's going super late, or he was, Scott, because I noticed, again, over the weekend, 
19 NFBC drafts. NFBC is a little bit different. Obviously, they're playing for upside. But 242 is the ADP. Are you still all right with taking Jared Kelnick there? He he moves yeah. up right around Jesse Winker and Will Myers, other guys we like as sleepers. W- would you take Jared Kelnick over both of those guys? I don't really consider downside for a pick after pick 200, let's say. Um it gets a little more complicated the deeper the league. Yes, 15-team leagues, you probably do have to consider downside until you've filled out your whole starting lineup just because there isn't much of a waiver wire after as the season's happening. But for again, for that, for the average user, 12 teams or less, just think in terms of upside after pick 200. That's that, I think that's a good general rule to follow. So that's a yes on Kelnick over Winker and Will Myers? Yes. All right, well, let's take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll get some of Chris's sleepers here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Welcome to the UEFA Europa League on Paramount+. Plus. What a night! Your home for more ultra-competitive, world-class soccer. Where Europe's elite and soccer Cinderella's pump out that one-of-a-kind white-knuckle excitement that grows with every cut, every cross, and each and every... Europa League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back into Fantasy Baseball today. Chris, let's get to your sleepers here. You've got two outfielders up top as well, one of which posted two exit velocities over 106 miles per hour on Sunday. Uh, which one was that? I didn't, I didn't notice that one. Riley Green. I uh, love Riley Green. He had a home run on Saturday, I believe, as well uh, to the opposite field, and yeah, Riley Green's another one. I, look, I love a post-hype sleeper. And Riley Green, one, was better than you think. He hit 253 with a 682 OPS. That's bad. However, within the context of the 2022 landscape playing at Comerica Park, that was basically a league average hitter. Now, hey, league average, that's not great. He only stole one base on five attempts, only had five home runs in 93 games. None of that is very good. However, this was a guy who we were talking about Maybe not the same way we're talking about uh, Jordan Walker right now. Maybe not the same way we were talking about Julio Rodriguez last year. But like, he was a top five consensus prospect, a top five or top top ten consensus prospect, top five in some spots. Uh, he has performed very well at the high minors: eight ninety OPS at AAA, nine oh five OPS at AA. He's got power. He's got speed. I think Riley Green like. He struck out a little bit too much as a rookie, and and that's a problem. But when you actually like dig into the underlying play discipline numbers, he didn't really have a ton of swing and miss in his game, and he didn't swing at pitches out of the strike zone all that much. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I think there was probably some just like, you know, maybe a, a lack of aggressiveness. His zone swing percentage was only 64. percent He's got to be more aggressive on the pitches that he can hit, but like. He posted above average exit velocities, posted max exit velo in the 86th percentile, hard hit rate 77th percent, sprint speed 59%, and that was coming off a broken foot. Because, oh yeah, he broke his foot in spring training last year and missed the first like two months of the season. That's a really tough thing for a 21-year-old player to do during his major league debut is to try to come back from that and hit the ground running. So I just think he's an incredibly talented player. He's still a guy who I think we should be very excited about. And and Riley Green tends to go outside of the top 175. His ADP at an NFC overall is 197.8. I'm not sure what it is lately, but I haven't really seen it get pushed up too much, and I'm ending up drafting him pretty much every draft that I'm doing. So I've got him as a top 150 player. I'm very excited to have Riley Green on my teams. And uh, – He's going to have a better home park because Comerica moved yep. the fences in in center field. So it yeah, won't I, be I, quite I, as cavernous. I think they changed, they made those changes specifically with him in mind too, because he, so he had only, only hit five home runs last year. Um, and, and somebody did the research and found he would have hit three more with these changes. So it would have been eight instead of five, which in less than 400 at bats is a pretty significant difference. His expected home runs by ballpark last year, lower at Detroit than any other venue. <laughs> Some of them, Several of them, he would have had double-digit home runs as opposed to the five he actually mm-hmm. hit. And, and this is with a horrible launch angle, like way too many balls on the ground. Yeah. Um, there have 
he didn't go into a lot of detail, but I saw one piece this spring about how um, he is conscious of that and wants to elevate the ball more. Yep. Again, it wasn't not a lot of concrete detail. Maybe he won't actually, but it, it, at least we know it's on his mind and that it's something that he sees the benefit in. So yeah, I, I, uh, I can get, I can feel, I, I can get enthusiastic about Riley the green too. I guess is what I'm saying. And his ground ball rate, while it was bad last year, 56% in the majors, it wasn't really a big issue. If you look mm -hmm. from 2021 and earlier, 47.6%, 43%, 43.8, 45%. Those were his previous four stops in the minors before that. So He's I, perfectly I'm thinking, fine. I'm thinking he could get, uh, Riley Green could get that launch angle up. Chris, who would you rather have? Because I, I think this is a decision you likely have to make as probably your fourth mm -hmm. outfielder in a lot of drafts, Riley Green or Lars Newbar. Uh, well, in TGFBI, I just went with both. Um, <laughs> so you can get around that. But yeah, I think I still have Riley Green ranked higher. Newt Bar is someone that I have moved up quite a bit since the start of the spring, not because of anything he's done in the spring necessarily, but just a desire to have more Lars Newt Bar in my life. I do have Riley Green a couple of spots ahead in my outfield rankings. It's 35 versus 37. Jordan Walker over both. <sighs> Because I had the decision, Newt Bar versus Walker, and fortunately somebody made it for me in TGFBI. It, took it is. So I went Walker. But now I think I just would have taken Walker anyway. Because I, I, I think I Walker over both. I would probably go with Walker over both. However, yeah, it's partially because you have to. Right. It's it's the kind of thing where if you want Jordan Walker. You can't like wait until Riley Green's off the board and say, "Okay, now's my chance." Like, or or Lars Newtmar's off the board because those guys are going to go are you way after to him. Miss out on, uh, on uh, I guess, in order to have Walker. I I think Jordan Walker probably has more upside. Yeah, although that's sort of just doing the mystery box thing. Jordan Walker has not played and struggled in the majors, which we should be honest. And acknowledge that the likeliest outcome for Jordan Walker is that he struggles a little bit as a rookie. Hitting in the majors is really, really difficult. And, like, it's possible he comes up in April, the ball's dead, and it doesn't fly out like it did last year. He gets frustrated. He starts making change. Like, there's a lot that can go wrong. We've not seen mm -hmm. this guy at the major league level. You're talking about upside, and that's the reason you take him. I would take him over Riley Green and, and Lars Newtbar, although I do not have it ranked that way yet. All right, Chris, who's the other sleeper outfielder you have? Uh, we've talked about him a lot. He was one of Scott's sleepers. The first time we did this, Brian De La Cruz uh, from the Marlins. You know, I'm a big homer, always touting the Marlins offense. You know how much I love that. Uh, no, he looks like a legitimately very, very skilled player. Um, he's a stat cast darling. Uh, 82nd percentile average exit velocity, 90th percentile expected WOBA, which that's actually even more impressive than it sounds because he does not walk ever. And so that is just the bat carrying the expected Woba there. And yeah. 96 percentile expected batting average, 94th percentile expected slugging percentage. Yeah, it's better, re better than Rafael Devers in both of those categories. Last I'm year. not sure I expect him to be one of the 20 best hitters in baseball. Yeah, Let me rephrase that. I do not expect Brian De La Cruz to be one of the 20 best hitters in baseball. You can fake those kind of numbers over a small sample size, and it's very, very heavily weighted towards one really, really great stretch at the end of the season. September, even with rosters not expanding as much as they did in the past, still I'm a little skeptical of late season breakouts. Brian De La Cruz costs like a 220th overall pick, I believe still. Uh, yeah, 220, 236.8 in yeah. NFC drafts. So this is not a sleeper in the traditional sense that nobody's talking about him because a lot of people like him. Well, I, I, it, it's interesting. I'm, if you don't mind me changing gears here a little Go bit. Go for it. Like, uh, of the all the players we're talking about now, De La Cruz might be one whose ADP isn't going up. because. Yes. And I've kind of cooled on drafting it myself because folks on the Marlins beat were saying, oh, it seems like the Marlins are leaning toward giving that left field job to Jesus Sanchez instead. 
I don't know how right they are. I hope they're wrong. I think Brian <laughs> De La Cruz deserves it a lot more, but it does give me some pause. Sure. When, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm weighing my options at that point in the draft. And uh, I, I think early in draft season, he and Lars Newtbar were getting taken a lot closer. And now there's a yeah. big gap between the two of them. Although like to a certain extent, there's, there is a, a bit of a diminishing returns on the Lars new Bart and Jordan Walker excitement, you know, like they can both play, but there is a, a little bit of a, there's a chance that they take away from one another in some way, or yeah. more specifically, Jordan Walker takes away from Lars new Bart, I think would be the more likely outcome. Yeah. I mean, those guys are, I'm not going to say directly correlated, but there is some correlation there between obviously all the Cardinals players and they, they both guys play in the outfield. So, uh, yeah, no, I think that makes sense with Newbar and Jordan Walker. A few sleepers for me. I mentioned this on our outfield preview. Oscar Gonzalez, interesting rookie season last year. He hit 296 with 11 home runs in just 91 games. He makes a lot of contact, and he's loaded with tools. 91st mm -hmm. percentile max EV, 88th percentile sprint speed. Don't love the, the ground ball rate at 51%, but he holds the ball a lot. He obviously hits it hard, and he has a 31 home run season in the minors. Oscar Gonzalez does. So I, I know people will point to the chase rate, extremely aggressive, but he still made a lot of contact. He had a sub 20% strikeout rate. You might say, okay, they'll, they'll throw him less fastballs this year. Okay. Well, 283 batting average against breaking pitches, 277 versus off speed. So I just think there's a lot to like here with Oscar Gonzalez in a sneakily improving guardians lineup. I, I think just overall they, they've, they've gotten better. They've added Josh Bell, Steven Kwan at the top there. So I do like Oscar Gonzalez. The ADP is at 186.8. I would take Riley Green and Lars Nupar over him, but I, I think he probably should go right around that range. Uh, and then Jorge Soler, someone that's going super late. This is for five outfielder leagues. If you need power, there's not many power options that late in the draft. His ADP is 332. If you're like Scott, you probably don't need power that late in the draft. But something I've done a lot of is pair Jorge Soler with Jesse Winker. I like their skill sets together. You, you could get good batting average from Winker, and then you get the power from Jorge Soler. Both guys are extremely injury prone, so I, I do realize there's a lot of risk involved there. But Soler still crushes the ball, hits it really hard, uh, and they're paying him. Like, the Marlins don't really pay a lot of guys, so $12 million. I think he's going to play as long as he's healthy. So good OBP, lots of power for Jorge Soler in those deeper five outfielder leagues. Let's get back into some more sleepers, Scott. We'll go to you, uh, and you provided me two pitchers, Jose Barrios and Trevor Rogers. Ah, yes. Thank you for telling me their names. <laughs> so my argument for Jose Barrios is very similar to the one I made for Jack Flaherty in Sleepers 1.0, which is basically just, okay, for the past five years or so, we all we're convinced this guy is an ace or pretty close to it. And even more so in Jose Barrios' case, he didn't have all the health issues Jack mm -hmm. Flaherty had. So he was consistently delivering on that potential. I, I always thought he was a little overrated. Um, sometimes he'd get drafted closer to top 12 when I saw him more as a top 24 guy. But the point was that we all thought he was good and he performed well. So last year, his second year in Toronto, so it's not like it was a venue change or anything. 523 ERA, 142 whip. Uh, even the K per nine were down 7.8. So it was it was just bad across the board, unexpectedly. And he did this as a 27-year-old without any obvious loss of stuff in terms of velocities or spin rates. It, it was uh, His control was still uh, like we're used to seeing it. So it was really hard to make sense of what was going on for Jose Barrios last year, which on the one hand um, makes it easy to ask, well, what's going to change for him this year? So it's it seems like the Blue Jays have pinpointed the problem as being a, a matter of locating his fastball. It He was kind of leaving it more in the zone against left-handed hitters. And specifically, the the numbers on that pitch, how much harder the fastball got hit for Barrios last year. Uh, average exit velocity. Um, so in, 18, in 2018, 2019, 89.1 was the average exit velocity. Two lefties on the fastball. Last year, it was 92.5. So they were just crushing it. 
uh, 381 batting average versus 239. So the results were clearly different and clearly different on that pitch. And, and one of the things we don't measure as well with the usual metrics we look to is location. So I, I think that's a reasonable enough argument considering he's going outside the top 200. And as I just said, once you're drafting beyond 200, it's not worth worrying about the downside so much. The odds of you dropping any player you take there is pretty high. We know what the upside is for Barrios. And given his track record, I think he's much more likely to meet that upside than most of the players you could draft at that point. So specifically as somebody who uh, not big into investing big at starting pitcher this year, who wants to take advantage of mid to late round bargains. You know, if, if, if Barrios had the kind of year he just had during the juice ball era and where quality starting pitcher with pitching was hard to find, he would not have dropped nearly this far because it was hard to find a pitcher who was even capable of doing, but what Barrios did, but because pitching has developed such a robust middle class now, Home runs aren't coming as easily. Uh, then Barrios is allowed to slide this far, and I think you should take advantage. And Trevor Rogers got the other one. I just looked at the ADP over the past couple of weeks, and they've gotten a lot closer together. So I I don't want to say that people are buying into just one spring start, but well, Trevor Rogers made another start on this. Yeah, two Sunday starts now. He looked good again, but his first start, <laughs> I know he threw the changeup more. He got a few whiffs on that pitch and. When Trevor Rogers broke out in 2021, it was really on the back of that changeup. So if he can get a feel for that pitch once again, then I don't think we'll get we'll see the player we did in 2021. But I think there's still a considerable amount of upside with him. Yeah, and as I pointed out, I mean it's been a few weeks since I pointed out, but as I pointed out before with Trevor Rogers, it looked like he was uh, getting back to that form last year. It was such a small period of time that it's hard to know what to make of it, but. So he missed a stretch with back spasms, had a chance to work on his delivery. Uh, as he was rehabbing to come back, he had this amazing start at AAA where he threw six no-hit innings and struck out 12. Then he comes back, Trevor Rogers, and his first three starts back from the IL, from that great rehab start, 295 ERA, 0.93 whip, 10.8 K per nine. His swinging strike rate was 13.1% as, as opposed to 10.7% before the injury. So it seemed like he may have figured something out right then. Next start doesn't go well. He leaves with an injury. He's gone for a long time again. So we, we don't know where it would have ultimately ended up for Trevor Rogers. But I, I was at the time it was happening, I was suddenly all the way back on board Trevor Rogers, uh, writing about him in the waiver wire column after every start. And uh, to see him back this spring and, and having immediate success only bolsters my enthusiasm for him, as it seems to be other people's as well. But again, I, he's still being drafted in a range, even if you just look at the most recent ADP data, where I, I think there's a clear case for Trevor Rogers being a sleeper. Remember, some people were liked him as much as like Alec Manoa and Shane McClanahan last year. That's the sort of range Trevor Rogers was being drafted in. So. Uh, don't sleep on the upside. Who would you rather have, Scott Berrios or Trevor Rogers? Berrios. All right. Back to Chris. You also have two pitchers going outside of the top. I believe they're both outside the top 200. I believe so. I have Jamison Tyone and Patrick Sandoval. We talked about Tyone uh, last week a little bit. He's introducing more of a sweeping slider to his repertoire because he really hasn't had that like go to swing and miss pitch. He's worked on the slider. The curveball has been it occasionally, but the the hope is that the sweeper can give him, you know, that go to put away pitch that he's really been lacking. Because if you look at the last couple of seasons, he's got good control, you know, when he's healthy, obviously. He's got good control. He gets pretty good results on balls in play. 360 expected Wobon contact for his career, 368 is the league average over that stretch, so better results on balls and play than league average. The problem is 21% strikeout rate last season, 19% in 2019. He's typically hovered right around or a little below average in strikeout rate. It's hard to be a really good pitcher if you do that. If he can just be a slightly above average strikeout rate guy, I think there's some room for Jamison Tyone to take a step forward. I'm like, he, he basically costs 
nothing. I mean, if we're if we're comparing him, yeah, two forty seven point two is his ADP. Love taking a flyer on it. I don't think there's like a ace outcome here for him, but the the good Marcus Stroman seasons, maybe maybe like a Chris Bassett like outcome. I think that's within the realm of possibility for uh, Jamison Town, Patrick Sandoval. Much more interesting pitcher. I think a much higher ceiling there. It's it's a fascinating commentary on this state of fantasy baseball that a 26 year old pitcher who just come coming off a 291 ERA uh, is outside the top 200. But one, pitching is easy to find, and two, we can look at what he did last season and know okay, he was probably more like a high threes, low fours ERA guy. He wasn't actually all that useful for fantasy. I still think Patrick Sandoval's got a world of talent. He's got. That changeup that is one of the best swing and miss pitches in baseball. Uh, the slider took a step forward last season because the changeup wasn't working as well for him. He actually started throwing it a lot more overall, went from 17% usage in 2021 to 29% last season. But specifically, he threw the, the slider in 2021 about as often against righties and lefties. Last year, he actually threw it almost uh, more than twice as often against right-handed batters than left-handed batters. He is a left-handed pitcher. So that shows the confidence that he had in this pitch to throw, you know, the, the slider, which is usually the one you take advantage of your platoon matchup with. But he was throwing against lefties and righties, getting very good results, 34% whiff rate, 261 expected WOBA allowed. The changeup was still excellent despite some struggles with it last year. I think if he can put it all together, there is just so much upside with Patrick Sandoval in a way that's not being factored into his draft costs because he's typically been also very good on the balls in play as well. So if we see that strikeout rate start to get back up to where it was in 2021 and he has to go uh, go to put away pitches, I think Patrick Sandoval could finally put it together this year. Chris, which Angels starter would you rather have, Patrick Sandoval or Reed Detmers? Uh, I think I will go against the consensus and say Patrick Sandoval. Uh, it's close. I've come around a little bit on Sandoval. I, again, hearing yeah. that he struggled with the changeup last year, and it, it's st- like the results on it were still pretty good. I mean, if that pitch bounces back closer to where it was in 2021, I mean, there, there's some pretty big upside with Sandoval. I think I would I would go with Detmers personally, but I like both. I do like both. Yeah, I like both. I had Demers and Breakouts 1.0. I'm actually putting Sandoval in, in, in Breakouts 2.0. This is sleepers, but, you know, you could fit into either category. But, yeah, yeah the these fact are that, amorphous categories, you know. The fact that he lost the feel for his best pitch and still had as good a year as he did, um, and the fact that the feel seems to be back this spring and he's committed to throwing it more and he just struck out six batters over three innings in his second spring start. I mean, nice. It's all kind of all the pieces are coming together. Yes. Um, and I was somebody who was kind of staying away from him in early drafts because, you know, yes, the ERA was great, but OK, it looks like he's going to hurt me in whip. Mm-hmm. I'm not as confident as I was last year. He's going to be a big strikeout guy. Uh, and, and like you said, there's a lot of pitchers to get excited about. But I think uh, I think based on what I've heard in from Angels camp regarding Sandoval so far has me hopping back aboard. And I do think, Chris, Sandoval and Tyone, obviously you take Sandoval earlier than you would Tyone. They're a good pairing together. I, I mm-hmm. like finding players like this that complement each other's skill sets because Sandoval is going to be a high whip guy. Jameis and Tyone, 1.13 whip over 177 and a third innings last year. That is really valuable. I, I don't know if it'll be that low again, but yeah. I think it's probably going to be sub 1-2 whip. And that's really that's really valuable where Jamison Tyone is going. So maybe pairing someone like him and Sandoval together. I'll give you another whip pitcher who's pretty good, and he's also going very late. It's Ross Stripling. He has an ADP of 271 last year, a 102 whip, 301 ERA for Ross Stripling. Throw your best pitch more. That's exactly what he did. Stripling threw his changeup a career high 27% of the time, nearly double as how often he used it in 2021. And... The results on that pitch were great. 203 batting average against 20.9% swinging strike rate. Nice park shift going over to San Francisco. It's a great organization to pitch for as well. So Ross Stripling, more of a higher floor guy. I don't know that the ceiling is insane, but a deeper league pitcher uh, that could provide quality innings for you. That is Ross Stripling. 
And then Kenta Maeda is someone I've mentioned here and there throughout the offseason so far. Returning from Tommy John surgery that he had back in September of 2021, now 17 months removed. So there's, the Twins are saying that there are no limitations with Kenta Maeda. If you just look at his career numbers, they don't blow you away. 3.87 ERA, 114 whip over a strikeout per inning. That's a quality pitcher. A uh, 13.6% swinging strike rate. So uh, Kenta Maeda is someone that I do like targeting quite a bit as well. He's going even later. I mean, 3.22.8 is the ADP for Kenta Maeda. Uh, either of you guys on Stripling or Maeda? I like Maeda more. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't see there being a lot more upside for Stripling than he showed last year. Uh, so I, I I think of him as more of a deep league like rotation stabilizer yeah. and somebody I'm eager to draft. So, you know, I, I probably only looked him in like a 15 team or deeper. Um, but Maeda, on the other hand, uh, I, I don't think he's going to get back to what he did in the short 2020 season where he's like a Cy Young contender. But oh, well, the I K agree. per nine should be good. The whip should be good. The ERA might be a little on the high side, but it should be fine. And uh, I, I think uh, the better he, at, with each with each passing start this spring, Maeda, it becomes more interesting to me. All right, let's get to our final groupings here. Chris, we'll start with you this time. Uh, you have a classic Chris Tower sleeper as one of these, uh, and then a new guy, uh, a youngster on the Boston Red Sox. Yeah, let's go back to Cattell Marte because. Last season was kind of a disaster for him, kind of a disaster for me because I had Cattell Marte on pretty much every single one of my teams, and that's a good example of why all my teams were bad at offense last season. But <laughs> there is still, I think, a, a ton to like about him. He still makes a ton of contact. Uh, still hit the ball very hard last season at max exit velo, 96 percentile. Average exit velo, only 72nd. Hard hit rate, only 61st. So wasn't quite as consistent as he had been in previous seasons, but I still think the hit tool here is very, very good. I still think there's some pop, probably not 30 homer power in this environment, but I still think he can be someone who hits 20 home runs, gives you a very good batting average. And is he outside the top 200 right now? No, he's, cl he's, he's close, barely close. inside. Yeah, it's 197.8. Like, it, at a second base position that's really not very strong, I really like Jorge Polanco. I'll take him ahead of Catal Marte. But if I don't get him, Catal Marte is a very, very good, you know, fallback to the fallback. I think there's two, two clear players that people just have fatigue on. They're done. Mm -hmm. Too many injuries. Catal Marte and Anthony Rendon. People are just out. They're going close to 200. And I understand why. But I mean, based on what they either what they've shown in the past or just yep. the team context with Randone, I mean, hitting in the middle of that Angels lineup, yeah, wh like why not going outside the top 175 in, in Could, ADP right now? Cattell Marte is the one that's the hardest for me to understand because so uh, okay, so last year happened, a lot of the underlying metrics were still great, as Chris pointed out. The stat cast page still looked pretty Had awesome for 42 Marte. doubles still. Last but season. let's leave last year out of it. Two of the three years prior to last year, Cattell Marte hit no worse than 318 with no worse than a 909 OPS at second base. In my initial rankings, I had him more like 150th, and I thought maybe I was fading him too hard. And then when the ADP data started coming out, and it's like, like really? You're going to give me Cattell Marte for a late-round pick? Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I, I know I have this plan where it's like, you know, I want an outfielder in round one, a third baseman in round two, second baseman in round three. The least important of those is the second baseman in round three because of guys like Cattell Marte who yeah. are lasting so late in drafts. And the other one, Chris, here is a, a uh, it's Tristan Casas. What, what do you got? Tristan Casas, uh, one of the, he's probably one of the top 25 prospects right now. He got up to the majors last season. Didn't exactly tear the cover off the ball, hit uh, 197, but did have a 76, 766 OPS, walked a ton, hit five homers in 27 games. The power is the calling card here, and that's going to be what carries him, although I think the, the plate discipline can be pretty good too. It's just a bet on youth. It's a bet on a talented young player. It's a bet on a talented young player 
who should have a very good carrying tool in the power. Um, and he's another guy who goes 229.2 is his NFC ADP overall. Yep. I would prefer to fill first base before that. Like I said, I did tra- take Trey Mancini in my TGFBI. Tristan Costas was definitely part of my plan. If I had been able to get him, I would have been happy with him. I'm not thrilled to get him as my starting first baseman, but in a 15-team league, I think he very well could be a more than passable option there. I don't mind it, honestly. 15-team leagues, um, you know, first base, I've talked about, it's one of the few positions that affords you a chance to wait. Uh, I'd rather dip into that Christian Walker rowdy, but if it doesn't happen, just because, you know, I, I miss out on the run or whatever. Either one of Miguel Vargas and Tristan Casas is my first baseman. I'm fine with. I, I went with Vargas and TGFBI um, and then was able to, I, I think I drafted Ty France the very uh, next round, mitigating some of the risk. But like, Tristan Casas has looked awesome this spring. And even though he hit, batted below 200 is in the majors last year, that was with five home runs uh, and, and what, how many at bats? Less than 100. And he reached pace at like a 350 clip, even with that low batting average. So like, I think he's legit. And um, he was in my sleepers 1.0, so I'm not talking about him here. But I, I'm very high on Tristan Casas as well. Yep. Uh, <laughs> make it all three of us. Clean sweep on Tristan Casas. Five home runs last year. Three of them to the opposite field. One of those coming off of Garrett Cole. So he's got all fields power approach. Mm-hmm. He can spray the ball to the green monster over the green monster if he wants to. I think there's a lot to like with Tristan Casas. I want to leave every single draft that I do with at least one of these fun prospects. I feel like you're willing to take multiple of these guys, which if they're bench bats, I don't I don't mind that. I don't I don't know if I want multiple prospects actually in my starting lineup, but Casas, Tovar. It was Jordan Walker, but now he's on the rise. In, in a 15 team league, it's hard for me not to have multiple in the lineup. I yeah. kind of can't get enough of them because it's yeah. just you go so deep into the player pool. I'll, I'd rather take the upside. Yeah, Miguel Vargas is one of those as well. Uh, yep. I just mentioned Scott, another one of your sleepers here, but you've got two middle infield prospects in Ezekiel Hovar and Oswald Peraza. Well, and Ian, just as I was saying for Tristan Casas and Miguel Vargas, the other position where uh, you could afford to wait a little is shortstop. Not as much. There's a pretty steep drop off. That happens a little earlier in the draft, especially if you're talking something deeper like a 15-teamer. Um, but then, even if you miss out, even like, okay, you you got a little too lax and the drop-off happens, you don't have your shortstop yet. Or if you're looking to fill the middle infield, middle infield spotlight, I think uh, Ezekiel Tofar and Oswald Peraza are two great options. They both showed plenty of power and speed in the minors. Um, and and specifically in Ezekiel Tovar's case, because there's no competition for him as the Rockies shortstop. The Rockies aren't going to mess this one up, I promise. They don't have anyone else to play shortstop. They've made it clear <laughs> Tovar is their guy there. They're not going to mess it up. They even lost Brendan Rodgers. There's, there's nobody else. So, uh, I, like... I, I share in the enthusiasm for Vaughn Grissom taking over at short, shortstop for the Braves, but I feel like the enthusiasm should be even higher for Tovar because they profile very similarly offensively. One for sure has the shortstop job for his team, and it's Tovar. And he's playing half his games at Coors Field, which means he's uh, uh, all the offensive production is probably a safer bet, but especially the batting average. Um, and that's. You know, I'm not sure how much help he needs there anyway, because he hit 319 between double and triple A last year, 927 OPS, 14 homers, 17 steals, and 71 games. So Tovar, he's going around 250th. And I don't I really don't understand it. I always get caught waiting too long, and I don't think I've drafted him in a league that counts yet. But that's dumb of me because I I think uh <laughs> I think my expectations versus where he's going, there isn't a much bigger discrepancy than for Ezekiel Tovar. Yeah, he's my utility in uh, TGFBI. Oswald yep. Peraza, I mean, part of the reason I guess maybe I miss out on Tovar is because Peraza goes even later, around 300. You look at the numbers this guy put up in the minors last year. Uh, he hit 297 with 18 homers and 38 steals. 
That was in only 115 games. And that was after a horrible start to the season. Both him and Anthony Volpe, it was, I guess it was really cold where they're playing their minor league games because their <laughs> Aprils were disastrous. And then they caught fire. Um, Peraza even more so. I will say that if you look at like the the scouting tools in the case of Tovar and Peraza, you know, the 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 20 to 80 grades for contact hitting and power hitting, it's lower than the minor league numbers would suggest. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind. I, I don't think it's so much of an issue for Tovar because he's at Coors Field and there's no competition. Peraza, because there's Anthony Volpe, who's also making a push to make the roster at some point, it gives him a little less job security. Also, there's Isaiah Kiner Falefa there. Um, but I do think I do think Oswald Peraza's contact skills are really good. I do think he's gonna run a ton. And if there's even 15 homer power, and it may be more, but if there's even 15 homer power, he's gonna be a great pick for you uh, as a middle infielder. Can I do a quick public service announcement? Yes, sure. please. Do not make the mistake I did uh -oh. in my Tout Wars draft where I used, I think, the last pick on Oswaldo Cabrera of the Yankees because they are back. I think they were back to back in the, yes. the draft room. They have the same name. And I was just like, oh, oh God, I'll take him. And uh, yeah, that that was uh, it's unnecessarily confusing that they have two guys with very similar. I mean, the same first name, kind of almost. Yeah, Oswaldo Cabrera versus Oswald. Yeah, that, that was very. But I, like, both, I looked at both it. Both similar minor league numbers. They both yeah. have power and speed. I actually kind of like Cabrera too as an even deeper yeah. sleeper. Yeah, he just the doesn't outfield. have as, as close to a secure. But like that was yeah. one that I just I got to the end of the draft and I was like, wait, what happened? So that that <laughs> yeah. just be careful in your yes. draft rooms. Yeah. Also, actually, you know, make sure you're drafting the right Luis Garcia. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there I mean, are three out there. I, I thought it feels, like, it feels like there's eight of them. Gosh, I mean, there's so many yeah. Luis Garcia's. Be I, really careful in your in your salary cap slash auction drafts. Yes, I actually wound up with uh, a lot of these players we're talking about. I got Luis Garcia. That wasn't really the plan as my middle infielder. I waited a little bit too long uh, in TGFBI. And then I've got Cabrera, Oswaldo Cabrera, as my sixth outfielder. He's on the bench. So uh, I think there's some pop. There's some power. Mm -hmm. There's some speed. Cabrera can move around. I, it wouldn't surprise me if he starts in left field. I think Aaron Hicks is kind of toast. Uh, but yeah, it, yeah. Like Cabrera, Cabrera can play a bunch of positions too. Well, just in the 154 at bats he got in the majors last year, six home runs, three steals. So, you know, yeah. you over 600 at bats, that comes out to 24 and 12. Not that he's going to get 600 at bats in all likelihood, but. You know, very deep leagues. I think uh, Oswaldo Cabrera is a bit of a sleeper, but not as much as Oswald Peraza. That's the real one I'm highlighting here. Scott, you did mention this, but I had a note, and we won't get to news and notes today. I'll save that for tomorrow. We've got some like injuries and things to talk about. But Aaron Boone indicated over the weekend that Anthony Volpe has a chance to break camp with the Yankees. And this is kind of the first time that we've heard the Yankees actually talk about that publicly. So, I'm just yeah. a tad nervous about Oswald Peraza now. I liked him a lot throughout yeah. the offseason. I still like the talent long term, but it just yeah. it leaves a little bit of uncertainty. I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to draft Anthony Volpe late too. It was more sure. of like a bench option because even if he's not on the opening day roster, he'll be up soon. Uh, I think in the long run, it's going to be Oswald Peraza playing shortstop, Anthony Volpe playing third, obviously, Glaber Torres at second. And so it's just going to take the Yankees being willing to turn the page on Josh Donaldson for us to see Volpe. Get him out of here. I've got two more sleepers. They're both pitchers, and they're both going outside the top 300. Brandon Fott of the Arizona Diamondbacks. He's a pitching prospect, and that's spelled B-F-A-A-D-T. It's a very... You said B. It's P. Fought. Yeah, you, you I wrote B. I know. I can. I can find his first and his last name. So I mean, it's spell long, it again, Frank. It's been a long weekend, guys. So, uh, Brandon Fott. You were out in the sun a lot, you know. P F A A D T. That is the last name. He's a <laughs> prospect with the Diamondbacks. Led the minors with 218 strikeouts last season. Uh, Ten starts in the PCL. Two six three ERA. Zero point nine nine WHIP. 10.8 K per nine. I don't remember seeing pitching numbers like this in the PCL yep. since Zach Gallon. And yeah, that's the toughest pitching environment in, in American professional baseball. 
Fott has looked really dominant so far this spring as well. He had a start over the weekend, three shutout, one hit, one walk, four strikeouts. Again, don't want to put too much stock into it, but this is a prospect fighting for a job, and he's dominating. He's looking really good doing it too. So I still like Dre Jameson, but I think I love Brandon Fott. I, I think he's a more complete pitcher. I think there's more talent there. I think there's more upside. And Scott, you'll like this. 29 starts last year for Fott. He went six plus innings in 17 of those. As a minor league pitcher, you don't see that ever. Like it's, he's uh-huh. he's different. He Brandon Fott is different. I think he could get like 150, 160 innings in the majors this season with the Arizona Diamondbacks, even if he isn't in the opening day rotation. So I'm fine stashing him. And Scott, you're you're if you're trying to talk, you've been muted for a while. So I'm running into an issue <laughs> where I can only draft so many. Uh guys who aren't even projected for roster spots right <laughs> like i can only have so many of those guys on my bench particularly yeah. particularly if it's a, a nfbc league where you don't have il spots um so that's why that's that's like the only reason i take dre jameson like i i think dre jameson's gonna get the fifth spot to open the year for the diamond back i agree sooner or later zach davies or somebody's gonna implode and fought's gonna be up and it's gonna be a thing of beauty is Zach Davies in the rotation? Because I think they're considering him for the bullpen as of now. I could have. I haven't seen that. I mean, if uh, that's true, then maybe there is room for more than just. It Davies. is a you know, it's one of those life finds a way type things. Like Zach Davies probably not going to have a job for too long, which is not great news for my Scott White Dynasty League team because I'm pretty sure I have Zach Davies in the rotation. But you know, <laughs> yes. 24 team league, we all make. Con- concessions in that one hey I, i've got rich hill in that league so uh, anything goes uh yeah zach davies is the fourth starter for now wouldn't surprise me with the spring that fought is having they just put both him and dre jameson in the rotation and put zach davies in the bullpen would not surprise this is, me. so just to further your point on thought at that same level that same triple a level for the diamondbacks dre jameson had an era over six Ryan Nelson had an ERA over five. They come up and they sh- they're yeah. like shutting out the Dodgers as soon as they come up. Yeah. So Fott uh, led the PCL in WHIP, zero uh, point nine nine. His I'm looking at his K minus walk rate. I think was twenty six point nine percent. That was the fifth best among all minor league starters last year. Yep. And that's obviously doing that in, tr- in the PCL makes it even more impressive. The dude is filthy. So uh, again, the name is. P-F-A-A-D-T, not, not with a B at the front there. Nick Martinez, the last name I want to mention here. Last season, 3.47 ERA, 1.29 whip. The whip is high. There's too many walks here. But a good amount of whiffs, 11.9% swinging strike rate, has a deep pitching arsenal, five pitches that he threw 14% or more of the time last year. Nick Martinez's curveball and changeup each had a whiff rate over 30%. The Padres are kind of relying on him, too. The back end of this rotation is, is very shaky. Uh, he's looked good so far in the spring. Should get a bunch of run support. He pitches for a great team in the Padres. And he's SPARP eligible on CBS. I mean, I feel like this has kind of flown under the radar here, but not a, a great SPARP year. We've got Strider. We've got Hunter Brown. After that, I'm pretty interested in Nick Martinez. So I, I think that he is a name. He's going well outside the top 300. You can get him with your last pick in, in a head-to-head points league. We are going to wrap there. A bunch of sleepers. We'll have breakouts tomorrow. And again, we'll get to the news from over the weekend. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.